Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Uh, bless his holy name. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 yes. You can't see me. Let me just show you this right here. All right. Okay. You can see me now. Okay. Cool. 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 Yes, sir. Bless you. Yes. <laughs> Listen, I was about to say happy Sabbath, but good evening, everybody. Good, good evening. evening. Good evening. I, I hope you all are well. Hope you all, my Berean SDA church family, hope you all are doing well. Listen, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, my pastor keeps introducing me like I'm a, a new speaker, but I, I, it's like family here. It's like family. And I've been so privileged uh, just to have him, uh, in, in, you know, just as my spiritual father and just so grateful uh, to be back. Listen, listen, I see, I see many names. Uh, uh, <laughs> so grateful just to share a word today. Listen, go jump straight to the word if that's okay. Go jump straight into the word. Amen. God. Listen, the words uh, in Luke, the word is in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I hope you all are having a good week as you turn in your Bibles. I hope you all are having a great week. It's been very busy and hectic for me, but I'm grateful just to slow down and to take the time for prayer meeting just to pray and to receive a word from the Lord. Luke chapter 10, and we'll begin at verse 25. Luke 10, 
and verse 25. When you have it, just say amen, put it in the chat, whatever the case is. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. This is what the word of God says. It says, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, uh, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus, asking him this question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will what, everybody? You will live. live. The man live. wanted to justify his actions, right? So he asked Jesus, and he said, and who is my neighbor, Jesus replied yes, with this sir. story. Now, I need you to pay attention. I need you to pay attention with this story. I need you to pay attention with this story. The Bible says, Jesus replied with the story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. When he saw the man lying there, he cried, crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there but he also passed by on the other side. Then the despised Samaritan came along. Bible says, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil, soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Listen, people of God, for the next few moments, <laughs> I'm excited about this one. For the next few moments, I want to speak to you under the subject, the Samaritan God. The Samaritan uh -huh. God. Listen, type that in. Type that in the chat, the Samaritan God. The Samaritan God. Listen, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for yes. your love, your grace, yes. and your strength. Thank you for all that you do. Father, it was by your stripes that we are healed this day. And God, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. God, for these next few moments, I pray that you will hide me behind the shadow of the cross. I pray that you will be with the technology that is bringing us all together. I pray, oh Lord, because the devil is preying on us right now. He wants to stop this. But Father, someone needs to hear this word. Someone needs to be set free. Someone needs to be delivered. And so, Father, we're pleading the blood of Jesus right now. Hide me behind the shadow of the cross. Let Daniel Charles may not be seen or heard. But let Jesus and Jesus alone, let him be lifted on and obeyed. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The Samaritan God. The Samaritan God. Listen, everybody, I know it's not Black History Month, all right? It's not Black History Month. Yet, it is never too often that we can take the time to celebrate the things that the Lord has done for our people. We celebrate the historic moments that our people have travailed over in this country. We can never stop celebrating the accomplishments men and women have obtained and then have opened doors for our people to go through. Today we celebrate, and every day we celebrate the Black man and the Black woman. See, it's not just a month, but we ought to celebrate each and every day that God has delivered the Black man and the Black woman and has brought them through to this time. But today, saints, I want to remind the body of Christ and all who are listening to the message today that we have a long way to go. Don't get comfortable. We have not, <laughs> we have not arrived anywhere. We should not park the car anywhere. We should not have a sigh of relief, but we should continue to fight the good fight as the Apostle Paul has stated, and to continue on the straight and narrow. Today, beloved, I wanted to remind us who we are, who you may be. For those listening right now, listen, we're not just African-Americans. We're not just Seventh-day Adventists who are on this thing congregating for worship we are African-American Seventh-day Adventists, and we are Christians. And I need to let each and every believer that is listening to this right now is that all of us have a duty 
to our neighbor. Mm -hmm. All of us has a duty to our neighbor. In our passage of scripture today, beloved, we see Jesus doing ministry on the road. At the beginning of this chapter, we see him sending out his disciples to carry on his ministry in the nearby towns and villages. We see him offering a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing on his disciples a few verses down. Now we encounter Jesus and a lawyer. The Bible may say expert of the law or it might say scribe, and they all relate to a lawyer in Jewish times. These were men who were trained in the law of Moses, memorizing it from front to back. They were able to interpret it for the uneducated man. It so happens that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were being sent away by the master. And now this lawyer thinks that he has a shot. I know the law, he must have thought to himself. And I'm going to teach this uneducated, born out of wedlock, poverty-stricken Nazarene, a lesson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Piously asked this man, he says, teacher, <laughs> what must I do to inherit eternal life? This was a popular question among the Jews that they asked. And your Bible says that Jesus turns his attention to the law in which the lawyer understands. He says, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answers in verse 27. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, 18, the law of Moses. And notice what the master does. In the New Living Translation, I love this people of God. He responds as such. He says, right, do this and you will live. I want to understand the scene of what's going on. The man asks Jesus the question. Jesus answers the question. And Jesus would, have, would not have went on talking about anything else. We would not have this story in the Gospel of Luke if the man didn't do this action. The Bible says in verse 29 that the man wanted to justify his actions. The Lord Jesus gave him the commandment to and be justified, yet the man wanted to justify himself. He wanted to best Jesus. And before I go any further in this message, people of God, let me pause parenthetically right here and let us know that all of us at one point in our lives have rejected being justified because instead we want to justify ourselves. We've come to Jesus claiming him to be teacher when we really don't want to be taught, but we want to be the teacher ourselves. Jesus mm. would have never told the story if the man just took what he said and went on his way. But now Jesus has to teach him this lesson. People of God, I need you to get this word right here. This word is for someone. Some of our testimonies would have never been testimonies if we would have just taken Jesus at his word. Let me say that again. Some of our testimonies would have never been testimonies if we would have just taken the Lord at his word. But because many of us want to justify ourselves, Jesus has to teach us a lesson. Mm -hmm. He asked Jesus, he says, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus goes along with the story. It begins with an unfortunate tragedy. A man from Jerusalem, a Jew, is headed towards the city of Jericho when he is attacked by roadside robbers. They take his clothes and beat him to a bloody pulp and leave him for dead at the side of the road. People of God, while this is a tragedy, I am not talking about the man being robbed. I am talking about the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Commentators say that this road was a very dangerous one, yet a common one because, get this, temple participants and workers usually take this road to get to Jerusalem. The Roman government in Judea understands that this is a problem, yet the religious and political authorities do nothing about it. Since it does not interfere with the commerce and wealth of the higher ups in society, no one is paying attention to it. Because it doesn't involve the income of those in office sworn to improve the lives of their countrymen, no need for any repairs. Because it doesn't mess with the because it doesn't mess with the funds of the established and educated, no need to look into it. Doesn't matter if the common man is on the road trying to earn a living for food for his family. Doesn't matter if the family is trying to move to a better place. Doesn't matter if the Jewish man and woman has clothes, their dignity taken away. Doesn't matter if the Jewish man and woman gets beaten and raped. Doesn't matter if they are left on the road, have naked, uneducated, low-income job, parent, 10 different siblings, in poverty, selling dope, in jail, gunned down. If it doesn't affect me, 
This is what the government said. They said, I don't care. This mm. is the attitude of the hierarchical society then, beloved. But as we can see, that society doesn't stray too far away from ours. Mm. But I need you to know this today, that there are three people listed in the story that Jesus tells today. I pray that we all make the right choice of who we should be. The Bible says, by chance, get this, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This is a priest, beloved, a priest. This is one who officiated in the public worship of God, ancient for sin, being ordained in the things pertaining to God, to offer both gifts and sacrifices to God. A priest, beloved, a priest. He was taken from the tribe, but more specifically, called from Aaron's family to minister in the temple. They were called to bless the people of God. A priest, beloved, a priest, a minister ordained to encourage the people of God, ordained to help the people of God, to preach and live righteously, to be an example to the people of God. And yet your Bible says that he passes by. And unfortunately, we've had such priests in the history in Christendom today. Our ancestors, get this, beloved, our ancestors knows of such priests, priests that would preach and live like Christ on Sunday, but who would be the devil to his slaves on Monday. Priests who preached that heaven was for everyone, yet the blacks allowed to set foot into the white heaven. Priests who preached the seventh commandment, not to commit adultery with another man's wife, yet who would take their female slave and sometimes rape them in front of their husband. Priests who wrote that all men are created equal, yet declare their human slaves to be nothing but three fifths of a person. Priests claimed the name Christian, yet took the name of their slave and gave them their own. An evangelical priesthood that claims to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, yet instead Christian nationalism and bigoted lies by having been promoted a president and an administration that took children away from their parents, disrespected Countries, vulgarized sports individuals, and was at the head of an insurrection. Priest, beloved, it was a priest, a bishop, mm. a pastor. Mm. That mm. Now, notice, beloved, that the priest will not touch the man because it will make him ceremonially unclean. <laughs> It will make him ceremonially unclean. The priest could not perform the duties in the temple if he touched a dead thing. But your Bible says that the man is half dead. Yet the priest doesn't check him out despite that, but sees and keeps on walking. Now, I need you to understand, beloved, what this priest did, what he did. This is what the Bible says in the Greek and in some of your Bibles. It says that the priest came down the same road. <laughs> he came down. The same road, the same road that the man went on and got jumped is the same road that the priest was coming from. In other words, the priest could have possibly been attacked as well. He went down the same road. He went down the same road. And he's already right uh -huh. speaking to every uh -huh. black individual uh -huh. in the virtual sanctuary today. Uh, I, I need to hear this, people of God. Some of us have gone down the same road. We have come from poverty-stricken communities, crime-infested neighborhoods, tragedy-filled homes, and yet the Lord has blessed us to further us in the direction he would have us to go. Some of us have good jobs, beautiful homes, blessed families, and the list can continue on and on. We may not have it all together, yet God has truly blessed us. But beloved, I need you to understand to your brothers and sisters who also could have gone, who also have gone down the same road. I need you to understand that they were left for dead and the robbers beat them and almost killed them. While you passed up the and grabbed the pencil, they took the joint and grabbed the gun. While you were employed right after college with the big company, they were employed mid high school with the drug dealer and prostitute of the neighborhood. While you've got the wife and kids waiting for you at home, they've got the baby mamas waiting for them at the courthouse. While you've got the great husband who loves his children, They've got a boyfriend for every last one of the kids, and they don't even know which one is theirs. They were left half dead. And instead of you assisting them, instead of you holding out your hand to grab theirs, instead of empowering them the tools to build themselves up, the Bible says that you see them and pass by on the other side. You talk about them when you pass the drive through You scowl at them when their parents are low and they're coming up at Walmart. You ignore them when they're speaking to you because you can't understand their language. We pass them by. The priest is supposed to take care of his people, not pass them by. Mm. Not to pass them by. 
Bible says, here it is, that the priest passes them by. But the Bible also says, beloved, that so too a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. A Levite, beloved, a Levite. A Levite was also called to ministry in the temple. He was not a priest, but he was a Levite. He was to be in the subordinate service and be of support to the priest. Honestly, the Levite also could have been in a situation to correct the priest if a mistake was made. Remember, he was an assistant to the priest, still called, still important. His task was to still be in the temple. Yet, the Levite feels that while he is in the world, that he should not be of the world, which means to him that he's not going to partake in anything that he sees as worldly. Mm, somebody not speaking to me right here, which means that he's not going to partake in anything that he sees as worldly. And beloved, I'm here to say it, that this was the reality of our Seventh-day Adventist denomination when we came about later in the 19th century. I need you to understand this, beloved. Our belief shaped how we reacted. So while I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, I don't think it is important for me to be involved with the things of this world. So now I believe in what you call sectarian theology, the belief that Christians should not come form to the second world on anything. In fact, you can read the overview and herald of that time to come and understand that white ministers promoted this concept and condemned those who would go against it. But you must understand that when you decide not to do anything or partake in the world, you now conform to the world because the world in and of itself will not say nothing to evil because it doesn't know any better. I do believe that there should be a separation between church and state. Yet when the state disregards the downtrodden in society, the church ought to say something and do something because we are mandated by it. The Levite does nothing. I want to stand, beloved, what the text says. The text says, when he arrived at the place, came and looked. Mm. We need you to get this, beloved. Look at your Bible. The Bible says when he arrived at the place, came and looked. Now, this is significant because it denotes that he stopped. It denotes that he stopped and looked at the man. Now, I suggest from the passage of Scripture that his neglect is worse than the priest. Because I need you to understand, the Levite stopped and looked. This means that he has enough time to see the man's bloody nose. This means that he has enough time to see the man's black eyes. This means that he has enough time to hear the man squeal for assistance out of his mouth. I need you to get this, beloved. This means that he has enough time to see the man turn his desperate eyes upon him, communicating with his eyes that he needs help. The Levites stopped and looked. And unfortunately, our country and the church has a history of stopping and looking. Our church has a history of stopping and looking. I need you to understand. Uh, our church stopped and looked when a black woman by the name of Lucy Hyard, who was suffering with liver cancer, could not be admitted into the Washington Sanitarium because of her color. Our church stopped and looked and took part in segregating its schools and even having to come up with a separate school system just for its black members in Huntsville, Alabama. Our church stopped and look with Martin Luther King spread his message of peace and social reform in our communities. Our church has stopped and looked. The Levites have stopped and looked. The priest and the Levite, beloved, have shown us that you can be the chosen of God and still be unloving. Mm. Someone needs to hear this word today. The priest and the Levite have shown us that your doctrines may be correct, but your actions are wrong. Priests and the Levite have shown us that we can very well become the priests and the Levite. But beloved Jesus now shifts his attention in the story and continues and says the word Samaritan. Mm, hold up, hold up, hold up, Jesus. So all roll, you've got to watch that word. Don't you know your manners, Jesus? Why would you say a Samaritan? You know we have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Samaritans were originally the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom after the split. Lord, they are not even Israelite. They are all mixed individuals after they were captured and assimilated into the different parts of the world. They mistreated us Jews several centuries ago when we were trying to build the temple and walls of Jerusalem. We Jews hate Samaritans. We don't even invite them to the temple in Jerusalem. They have their own place of worship, Jesus. You almost gave us a heart attack, Jesus. Change the word in the story, Jesus. Jesus, a Samaritan? Are you serious? Don't say that word, Samaritan. And Jesus says, and continues the story, but a certain Samaritan, 
as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, I need you to understand, beloved, that the priests, Levite, and Samaritan all saw the man, but the Samaritan was the only one who saw the man. Okay, okay, you'll, you'll, you'll catch that later tonight. Uh, the priest, Levite, and the Samaritan all saw the man, but the Samaritan was the only one who saw the man. He had compassion for the man. He just doesn't see the broken bones, bloody face, and naked body, but he sees a father that was just trying to earn a paycheck to feed his family. He sees a human being just trying to do honest work. He sees a soul in desperate need of a savior. And I've been a little negative on the body of Christ today, beloved, but can I encourage, can I encourage you today that while we as the church have suffered from being a priest and a Levite, there are many of us who have been Samaritans. Uh, did you know, did you know uh, that James Edson White, you're about to get a history lesson right here. James Edson White, the son of Ella White, started a steamboat ministry called the Morning Star and sailed down the Mississippi River in order to evangelize the blacks in the South. But before he ever preached the gospel to them, did you know that he set up night school in order to teach blacks how to read? Did you know that Matthew Strachan, a black Seventh-day Adventist minister, was king in continuing the Negro Department of SDAs and was an activist in all the churches he passed? Did you know that Alfonso so Green Sr., a black Seventh-day Adventist uh, pastor attending Oakland at the time, went to the white segregated Huntsville Central Seventh-day Adventist Church on Sabbath morning and demanded that they come and worship. He would be, be denied at first, but several weeks later, the church voted to integrate them. Did you know that Eva B. Dykes, a black Seventh-day Adventist woman, was the first black woman to receive a PhD from Radcliffe College, which is now a part of Harvard University? Did you know a woman by the name of Irene Morgan? Oh, listen, listen, listen. Before you had Rosa Parks, I need you to understand that you had Irene Morgan. <laughs> Uh, Irene Morgan, a black ad, a seven day Adventist day woman, after a miscarriage happened in her life, she got on the bus to see a fertility specialist. When a white couple got on the bus, the bus driver demanded that she give up her seat. <laughs> she refused. Uh, not only did she refuse, but unlike Rosa Parks, when the officers came in to arrest her, she fought them. <laughs> uh, she fought those officers. Uh, when she was due in court, Thurgood Marshall and William Henry Hastie took up her case to the Supreme Court and won. Did you know that Martin Luther King was not only joined by his, his Southern Baptist pastors, but I need you to understand that he was also joined by Frank Hale, uh, uh, Randy Stafford, Earl Moore, Jacob Justice, J. Paul Monk, Warren Banfield, Miles Martin, all Seventh-day Adventist ministers who partook in marches and demonstrations, even when our denomination was against him. Did you know about E.E. E. Cleveland and Charles Brooks and Charles Bradford? Did you know that the prophet of our church, Ellen White, was an abolitionist and an advocate for justice? She spoke against the evils of slavery and the Civil War and spoke out against Abe Lincoln before anyone knew the undertakers. Beloved, I need you to understand that while we as a church have sometimes have been participating in priests and Levites, we have been priests and Levites to people. I need you to understand that we still serve a God who was a Samaritan. Oh, okay. Okay. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, listen. Before I get to that, I need you to understand the Bible says that the Samaritan went over to the man, took out his bandages in his sack, put some olive oil and wine on them, used for medicinal purposes and placed them on the man's mouth. He picked up the man and laid him on his donkey, got to a nearby inn and continued to take care of him. I need you to watch that, beloved. The Samaritan did not just stop and put some band-aids on him and leave. He did not just drop him off at the end. The Bible says that he took care of him. In other words, he kept putting oil and wine on his cuts and bruises and kept rebandaging them. He kept doing it. It was on repeat throughout the night. It never ceased. It was not a one-time thing. He was not trying to be a one-hit wonder. He was not trying to do something to say he did it, but this was a continual ministry because the man knew that one bandage wouldn't kill the man, but he needed to do it until the man was able to recover. And I guess what I'm trying to say to Adventism and Christian as a whole, do we realize that a one-time event doesn't heal anybody? Anybody? We need to be continually ministering to men, those whose wounds will take time to recover. Uh, the next day comes and the man hands the hotel manager two denarii, the equivalent of two days wages. He's willing to sacrifice his expense for the man's well-being. He's willing to make another trip, go out of his way to make sure the man who is a Jew would be okay. And can I let you know, beloved, that if the Samaritan was in the position that the Jew was in, the Jew would have probably passed by on the other side. 
And yet, the Samaritan, the Samaritan, with all godliness in him, heals the man, gets the man, brings him to an end, and is willing to pay for him. And then Jesus says this. Jesus says this. This is about to close. But the Bible says, Jesus says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The master now asks the question. And, if, and unfortunately, the man replies, the one who showed him mercy. Now, I say unfortunately, beloved, because the story has not changed the lawyer. Because he cannot even bring himself to say the term Samaritan. Jesus says, now go and do the same. Now, notice, beloved, that Jesus does not say at the onset of, of this story that this is a parable. Mm. Jesus does not say that this is a parable. And you would come to understand that a parable is only an allegorized, made-up story trying to portray a point. He does not state that this is a parable. Some commentators say that this is a real-life example of what actually happened. And I've come to tell you on this day, on this prayer meeting, beloved, that the situation in our country and in our church today, it is not a parable, but it is real life. Jesus addressed the issues in his culture, and we must do the same. But before I close, beloved, I got to tell you that we still fall short of being the Samaritan. After all the food drives we could do, all the voting promotions, all the clothes drives, we still end up being like priests and Levites. More so, we are the half dead man. But can I let you know that we serve a God who is a Samaritan? <laughs> we serve a God who is a Samaritan. And before you crucify me and tell me that I blasphemed and that you say that Jesus was Jewish, I need you to look at the text. We were the man going from Jerusalem to Jericho. We were the ones being robbed, stripped naked, beaten, and left for dead. The police didn't want anything to do with us. The Levites stopped and looked at us, and they both passed us by. But how many of us, how many of us know that there was someone who saw us and took compassion on us? He bandaged my wounds. He gave me medicine for my sickness. He took me to the end and kept working on me. And when I couldn't pay the innkeeper, he offered to pay the price. And we don't have to worry for paying for the services of the innkeeper, for the Samaritan vows to come back again. So I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret. All I have to do is recover. And when the Samaritan comes back, all will be better. Is there anybody that could just blow up the chat right now? Is there anybody that could just lift your hands wherever you at and say, I serve a God who is a Samaritan, a God who picked me up, a God who turned me around, a God when I was left half dead and when I was left for the crows, he still picked me up. Is there anybody that can say, I serve a God who is a Samaritan? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and listen, beloved, listen, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm closing right now. But I needed to remind you this day. I needed you to remind you this day of the things that you see on in the world. And if there is someone that dare says that the gospel, that we need to preach the gospel and not do anything, not, not to march, not to say anything about the stuff in society today. Listen, beloved, the gospel is freeing, not just from sin, but also from what society holds on us. Listen, beloved, I need you to hear this. We are mandated by the creator to lift our voices for those who cannot do it for themselves. The mm. Bible says that we are called to the oppressed. We are called to the orphan and the widow. We are called to uphold the bloodstained banner. People of God, I just want to let you know today, who are you? Are you the priest? <laughs> are you the Levite? Are you even the half dead man? Today, because we serve a God who is a Samaritan, he is willing to also make us Samaritans as well. Father, we thank you so much for the word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. God, we found out tonight, dear Lord, the church and the world, dear Lord, that we live in has a problem, dear Lord. And yes, Father, we understand that all problems won't cease until you come, but Father, we are still called to make a difference. We are still called to proclaim the gospel to the poor, to the brokenhearted, to those who are bruised, to those who are going through. And so, Father, today, God, I'm praying for that person, dear Lord, who says, man, I'm in that position. I have been a priest and I have been a Levite. But Father, today, because we accept what you have done on Calvary, we can all be Samaritans. So God, for that person who is right now trying to make a decision whether or not 
to join the body of Christ, to be a lover of Jesus. Father, I pray that you will impress upon their heart, that you will encourage them during this time. And Father, when it's all said and done, I pray that you will save them in your kingdom. Father, we love you. God, we praise you. Thank you for being a Samaritan. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you, preacher. Thank you for the word. The Samaritan God. Beloved, if you've been blessed, touched, moved by this word, please unmute your device and let's just share the amen with each other. The hallelujahs. The praise the Lord. Amen. We've been sharing in our singular places of worship. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, amen. praise the Lord. Woo. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for that message. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I, I, <laughs> these young boys be messing me up every time. I don't know. I don't know what to say. But let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Uh, allegory or a parable or real life, real world. Uh, all of us, somewhere, somehow, has had an experience. We have either been the wounded man, we've been the Samaritan, we've been the Levite, or we've been the priest. What did you learn from this message? How has it touched your life and how do you plan to apply it so that you can be better for the Lord? Hey, man. Hey, man. Pastor, can I just say something? Yes, sir. Uh, two nuggets. The first one that just stuck out to me, I never heard this preacher like that. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Pastor, for uh, for the way you uh, brought it to light, uh, 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 Pastor Charles. Uh, the first nugget was they all saw the man, but the Samaritan was the only one who saw the man. Yeah, that, yeah, that, I that's heard. Just, it's, it's a simple statement, but it just speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, I got to go to we serve a God who is a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just that was just that was just deep. I know that jumped out at everybody as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if if if, if uh, we haven't yet in our lives come across someone who needed our assistance. Um, I mean, when we do, we ought to think about, I wish everybody could have heard this word. Uh, it's about getting out of your comfort zone. And mm. I just want to thank God that, that I would be able to be a Samaritan should I find myself in a situation like that, or should God give me an opportunity to, uh, to make a difference and not just minimal difference, but maximum difference. Thank you for the word, Pastor. Amen, amen, amen. Anybody else? Uh, Pastor, I I felt like I, I was all three, the, the priest, the Levite, and have been a Samaritan. I've been in a situation where my my bouginess and my, oh, no, I can't do that. I can't extend myself right now would kick in. But then God would convict me through the Holy Spirit and said, no, that's one of my children. And that could have been you. I saw myself that could be you on the ground. That could be you who needs help and you need to stop what you're doing and do everything you can to assist that person within your means. I, I literally, I felt like the other day there was a situation where a sister in the church needed help and I was trying to figure out who could I call, who could I go to, who can I turn to? And that's when I began to pick up the phone and call whoever I could get we need to help her. I can't stop what I'm doing right now, but I know you probably off work today and you maybe you could stop what you're doing and we can go and assist this person. And then God worked it out. He worked it out. No, it, I, maybe you couldn't, it wasn't for you to do it right then, Pastor Weaker, but I got sister so-and-so and sister so-and-so and they came together and they went and helped our neighbor because we all end up in that Samaritan's position from time to time where we're the ones in need of the help and we we will accept it from even quote unquote a samaritan even the people we have 
prejudiced against those who we deem unworthy they have they have the same opportunity to bless us and take care of us as well and i am thankful for this word tonight it truly blessed my soul and and it just reminds me i'm not gullible if i want to help a homeless person i'm not gullible if he gonna go drink alcohol that's not the point you have to see the person you have to see the man you have to see who god loves and so often it's beautiful saints like i'm gonna just use sister Masi for example who sees the people and then the next thing you know they're at our church and we have to minister to them not one time two times but on a consistent basis and it takes a lot of energy and effort to deal with somebody on a continuous basis it's a lot of strength and it's a lot of getting out of our pride and humbling ourselves to help that person and it's sometimes even being hurt and feeling like oh I'm possibly being used but let God use you and let him direct you as we assist others and that's just what I took away from night. And I'm going to continue to remember that the next time I need to help, need to help someone or I'm the one in need of help. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, Pastor. I'd like the, to express the idea that the Lord had shown me. Yes, we must help people who need help until they don't need help anymore. It's like we're setting them up to not be the helpee, but to become the helper. We mm. have to do God's work until the person we're helping turns into a helper. Mm. Mm. One time just won't do it. Usually not. Yes. Anybody else? Yeah, preacher. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, help. Uh, what what I what I got from um, the message. <laughs> I, I, we often forget the innkeeper mm -hmm. and I think um, the innkeeper was given a task mm -hmm. and he was given a command take care of this man until I return mm -hmm. he didn't give a date when he would return Mm -hmm. it could have been a year two years and he said when I come back mm -hmm. I will give you you know uh, whatever is owed mm -hmm. so the innkeeper as well we often forget him but um, him or we can say her you know um, they played a great part because yes the Samaritan did you know pick this man up in the roadside but he took him to the inn and the innkeeper was the one that washed him and nurtured him and clothed him and took care of him and we often forget that and one thing that struck me is that I wonder is our church what 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 our church you know on, on a world church are we are we Samaritans? Are we innkeepers? Or are we priests and Levites? Because I often feel that our church is uh, priests and Levites because there are so many people in our church that are hurting. And not just hurting financially, but are just hurting because of life. You know, life is difficult. You know, um, you know, there is a book written by uh, M. Scott Peck, The Road Less Travel. Mm. And in that book, you know, uh, the first chapter, which is the first, also the first paragraph, it simply says, life is difficult. And there are people in our church that are hurting and they feel neglected because no one has taken the time to know who that person is. So they don't know they're hurt. When we're trying to get the numbers 
to get them in the water so that we can have a report, we're behind them. Once we get them in the water, we seem to forget them. And we get them in the water and they're still struggling. They're struggling with life, you know, whether it's substance abuse or, you know, um, uh, uh, some type of a, a, a addiction, whatever it is, you know, they're struggling and we're not there to lend that helping hand. And I've seen this. I have seen this. I have spoken with individuals in our churches that were hurting and people that we encourage, first of all, to go to our, our church schools. They sent their children to our church schools, not really take realizing how expensive it is to get an education at our church schools. And that's another issue I have, you know, another thing I can't understand. Why is it that we make it so expensive to get an education at our schools? You know, and, and parents came to me and spoke to me and said, told me their demise. And I went to pastors personally and spoke to them and said, can we do something for these people? Can we lift a special offering? They have their children in the school. And if we don't, if they can't pay this money by a certain date, they will be asked to leave. And I was told by pastors, we don't do this here. And nothing was done to help. And these are burdens that I have. You know, so I often wonder, you know, where do we stand as a church? And I, I appreciate the way the preacher brought this scripture to life, to show us in a different light. You know, and um, we might not be able to do all everything for everyone, but we can try in some way. You know, sometimes people just need a phone call to say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about you. You know, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's difficult. As you know, preacher, I'm now, and I'm going to close in a minute, but as you know, I had four different surgeries on my ankle. And the church knew I was having surgery. You know, and I had one sister that called me um, as I was about, yeah, I was about to go into surgery. I was, uh, they were preparing me, um, you know, I was filling out some paperwork and so forth, not preparing me um, before I went into the, uh, the, um, the operating room. And she called me and I told her, I said, sis, you know, I'm taking care of this paperwork. Uh, can you call me back maybe you know, uh, tomorrow, because I'm going into surgery, I'm going to be under the anesthesia, I won't be able to speak to you. And I never got a call back from mm -hmm. no one. And I had four different surgeries. I went into church, had cast on up to my knees on crutches. And here I am standing in the back and not one usher. And they're all just walking back and forth. Not one usher approached me and said, brother, do you need a seat? Or not, do you need a seat? Would you like to sit here? Not one. And when I finally found a seat on my own where they have parents to sit with children, because that's the only place I can sit because I couldn't bend my, my leg because the cast uh, restricted me from bending at the knees, they literally came and had me move. This is the type, this is what I'm talking about. We don't have that love. We don't have that compassion. We don't have that care and concern. And I had one church member call me like two weeks ago and wanted me to pick them up to take them to Manhattan. Never called me when I had surgery, but when she called me, she said, oh, how did the surgery go? <laughs> I'd say, sis, you know, I'm gonna call you back. <laughs> you know. I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to laugh, preacher, but uh, elder, but you're right. Um, 
as I'm listening to you and as I'm listening to the preacher and the message. And I know he said uh, it was Black History Month. It doesn't have to be Black History Month to, to preach the kind of word he preached today. But one of the things that's coming to my mind as you speak, and as I've heard uh, other people speak is, whenever I fly on a plane, right before we take off, the hostess, stewardess, is said to you, in case of a turbulence and the cabin goes uh, without air, a mask, would drop uh, from overhead. Put your mask on first before you help someone that's next to you. And, and, I, and I think what's going on in the church of the living God, uh, and, 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 and I, I know firsthand what you're saying, and I don't know it from one perspective, I know it from seven different perspectives because for the last 23 years, the Lord has blessed me to pastor seven different churches because of the way our organization moved us from place to place. And you can give people what you don't have. The problem with our church is People genuinely just don't have it. And I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about that love, that genuine relationship and, and, and brotherhood. Uh, I have said over and over, we lie to each other on Sabbaths. Or when we meet maybe on, on, on other occasions and we say brother this and sister that. And we're really not brothers and sisters because we don't know each other. We don't know where each other live. We don't even you know, invite each other to each other's house. We don't know each other. How, how do you call me your brother or your sister when you don't even know me and I don't even know you? And we're always looking over our shoulders, watching for each other because we are afraid of each other. You and I talked about it, or you mentioned something the other day and I said, you know, it's scary for me to turn to, and I'm the pastor, to turn to one of my members and just say, I love you. You know, it's, oh, you know, the pastor, did you, did you, the pastor said, uh, I don't know what the, you know, it's, it's just so, we are so afraid of each other. And, and that's the reason. It is not because we don't want to do it. It's because we don't have it to do it. We, we don't know how to do it. All we know is and, and, and I got to be careful how I say this, but it's the law, the L-A-W, instead of the L-O-R-D. Because when you know the L-O-R-D, then you will see other humans for who they are, for what they need, for how you can aid them uh, without looking for nothing in return, you can you can look, you know, but but it's the L A W. So we've all have become just like the Levites and the Samaritans. I mean, and the and the priests. We don't want to be ceremonially unclean, so we're not going to touch this person. That's the L A W. We we don't want to be victimized, so that's the L-A-W. So like the Levite, we come, we look, we see this bloody man, but, but if we touch him, we may be contaminated by the blood. We, you know, it may mess up our clothes and somebody will see us and ask, oh, where are you coming from? 
Why you got blood on your clothes? So, so we walk away. But the Samaritan God comes. He really doesn't care whether he got blood on his clothes, whether he knows this person, whether he, because he has love. See, God is love. And because he has it, he can give it. But we can't give it because we don't have it. And, 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 and so, you know, we're blaming each other for something we don't have. You know, when I, when I do counseling, I'm a family counselor, 16 years. And I tell families when they come in, the husband is mad at the wife, the wife is mad. I say, don't expect people to give you what they don't have. You will be disappointed. You know, and I believe this message tonight, and we thank you again, Pastor Charles, as we close, that this message is intended to help us to go back to the source to get what we need so that we can be able to share it. Listen to what the Samaritans did. He gave those two coins. He had it to give. Then he told the innkeeper, like you said, take care of him, whatever you spend. When I come back, I'll give it. He had it to give, but we don't have it. We don't have love. We don't have care. We don't have concern. We don't see others as ourselves. And no matter how we try, we would not be able to give it because we don't have it. Pastor Charles, we thank you again for the word. Beloved, um, it's too late for us to take up our offerings, but you know where we are and you know how you can get it in. I'm gonna ask Elder Manuska to give us our benediction. May Yahweh bless you. May this word go with you. May it touch your heart. It may it cause you to ask God to give you that thing called love that we all need so that we are not afraid to share it in Yeshua's name. Pastor, just before I pray, I wanted to make sure that um, a comment that was said and during our post to acknowledge some um, sister Edwards typed in our chat and to go in line with what you were saying that our message is perfect, but we are not. We are imperfect people relying on God for perfection at each stage of our spiritual development. So just a reminder that though we know we should do it because we're imperfect people, we're all still struggling to do what it is that we're called to do. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Amen. No problem, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your man servant, God. As we have discussed tonight, God, I pray that we remember our ethic is not the law, but it's not about our it's not our doctrine. Our primary ethic is love. And I pray that as we go about the rest of our week, that we will embody that through your grace, that we will ask for your help to embody what it is that you have called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah, good night, everyone.